Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see you all, and uh, I appreciate you being here this afternoon and spending part of your day uh, with me here. So thank you for, for that. Uh, so I'd like to dedicate uh, this performance uh, to our fearless leader, uh, Dr. Reverend Dr. Jill Kirshner Rose who is watching online, and I want her to know how much she means to me and how special she is, and so this, is, uh, this music will be playing will be in your honor. Love you, Jill. Um, I hope you enjoy my presentation and the music my colleagues and I will perform for you this afternoon. So without further ado, uh, here's my lecture recital on the chamber music of Melanie Boney. So you'll see there's PowerPoint here and one there, so you choose where you would like to look at. Uh, so to begin, I'll uh, mention uh, a quote given by her great-granddaughter, Christine Gelliol. She writes, we were all surrounded by music, but none of us was interested in the compositions of our ancestor. We knew vaguely that she had been a composer, but we never talked about it. Whenever her name came up, it was almost always in the context of the many unwanted piles of scores occupying space in the basements of Aunt Jeanne and Aunt Yvette. Her image was colored by an old family secret revealed little by little, but even that didn't really interest any of the present generation. So Melanie Helena Boni was born in Paris on January 21st, 1858, to a devoutly Catholic middle-class family. As an adolescent, she prayed regularly, read daily devotions, attended mass and confession weekly. Religion played an important role throughout her life. Unlike other women composers, such as Amy Beach, Cecile Chaminade, Fanny Mendelssohn, Clara Schumann, and Alma Mahler, Boni was not raised in an artistic environment. Her family, nor the one she ultimately married into, supported her interest in music. As a result, she was a self-taught pianist. She began composing at age 12. Oh, it's going a little backwards here. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> she began composing at age 12, uh, shortly after a family friend recognized her talent. And at age, oh, and at 18, here we're at the very bottom here, uh, she met Cesar Franck, who ultimately introduced her uh, to the Paris Conservatory. Here she is at age 19 uh, when she entered the conservatory. So she officially enrolled uh, where she took classes in harmony, composition, and accompaniment. Among her classmates were Debussy and Pierney. While there, she excelled in all of her classes. She was awarded second prize in harmony and accompaniment, and a year later, at age 20, she won first prize in harmony. This was a feat in itself as Sexism at the conservatory was rampant. Before going on, I, I should mention the societal contexts at this time in France, specifically toward the end of the 19th century and early 20th century. 
So in 1804, the Napoleonic Code restricted women to their role as the rep Republican mother, which meant they were to take sole responsibility for raising the next generation of soldiers, workers, and citizens. Patriarchal ideologies permeated French culture in every way, and the consensus among philosophers and scientists supported the notion that women were accountable to the Republic by way of raising a family. In her writing on women and the Prix du Rome in French cultural politics, Annegret Fauser points to the legal authority men as husbands and fathers had over women, which stipulated wifely subordination and obedience. So as such, professionally driven women went against the grain and their role in society. In his writing from 1891, uh, Pope Leo XIII writes, women are not suited for certain occupations. A woman is by nature fitted for homework, and it is that which is best adapted at once to preserve her modesty and to promote the proper bringing up of children and the well-being of the family. To further curb women, uh, a new law passed a year later in 1892, which restricted the number of hours women could work, and it also prohibited them from working at night. So you, as you can see, Boni grew up in a time in French society where pursuing an artistic career as a woman was an enormous challenge. Not only was it unlikely, but it was also extremely difficult to be taken seriously as a female composer. The choice of repertoire at the conservatory only fueled prejudice against female musicians and the notion of intellectual inferiority. In her writing on female pianists and their male critics in the 19th century, Catherine Ellis discusses feminine versus masculine aspects of repertoire, saying that Beethoven and Liszt was never assigned to female students, as it was deemed beyond their comprehension, and performing it would only devalue the music and expose their lack of understanding. The scrutiny that came with gender is evident in music critics Gustave Choquet's 1860 review of female pianist Louise Matman. He says, what pleases me in Madame Matman's playing is that she does not seek to draw more sound from the instrument than her physical capabilities allow. Her playing could be fuller, but it is sweet, even limpid and feminine. To play like a woman is a grace. It is an attraction that too many women pianists now disdain. I have emoji in, uh, an emoji in mind, and you can probably guess which one that is. <laughs> um, so uh, further evidence on the prejudice of uh, women at the conservatory faced is evidence in the fact that women were not allowed to compete in the Prix du Rome competition, which was a French scholarship uh, competition established in 1663 during the reign of Louis XIV. And this awarded winners a three-year stipend to study in Rome. The first woman to ask for uh, permission to enter the competition was Marie Isambert in 1874. Her request was denied, uh, given the belief that women should not partake in public art events and fear that they would abandon their prescribed roles in society. So it would be nearly three decades later, uh, in 1903, that women were actually allowed, finally permitted, to uh, compete in, in the competition. And the coveted Grand Prix was not awarded to a woman until a decade later in 1913, when Lily Boulanger, sister of pedagogue Nadia Boulanger, uh, won the competition. While at the conservatory, Boni met classmate Amade Hedich, a singer, poet, and later conservatory professor and music critic. Sadly, their relationship was rejected by the Boni family for fear that their daughter would fully delve into what they deemed a dangerous artistic world. Much to the disappointment of the director and her teachers, the Boni family withdrew Melanie from the conservatory in 1881 when she was 23 years old. Two years later, uh, at age 25, her family arranged for her to marry a wealthy businessman 
Albert Dumonge. He was 25 years her senior, twice widowed and with five sons. Unlike his wife, he did not share Melanie's spiritual ideals nor her love of music. She had three children with her marriage, uh, from her marriage with Dumonge, and for the next several years, she fully devoted herself to raising their combined eight children. Here we see a photo of her and the spectacular three-story home they all lived in. It was 11 years into her marriage that Bonnie finally resumed writing. Her path led her back to Hedich, who by that time was also married. This reconnection resulted in a period of collaboration where she set his poems to music. Their Rise My Soul expressed the love they still had for one another. According to her great granddaughter, it was Hedy who opened the doors for Bonnie to connect with the top Parisian publishers. At age 42, uh, she found herself pregnant with Hedy's child. And the birth of her daughter, Madeleine, in 1899, marked a new era in her life. And despite suffering from severe depression, she focused all of her energy into composing and sought to promote her music. So here's the Société de Compositeur Musique. Uh, this organization was formed in 1862 with the intention of providing a platform for composers. She joined the year her daughter was born in 1899, and the society held competitions with which both attracted and rejected well-known composers. Members included uh, César Franck, Saint-Saëns, Faure, and Massenet. Of its approximate 400 members, about 6% were women. She entered her works twice and won prizes, one for her suite that became the basis of the forest scenes, which we'll, we will play for you today. And later in 1910, she was appointed secretary of the organization, which was a rare position for a woman to hold at that time. Her involvement with SEM led to several of her works being performed by notable musicians in reno renowned concert halls. So before I give a general overview of her compositions, I'd like to mention that she drew inspiration from female personas in history and literature, all which had influential roles and positions in their lives and stories. She titled a number of her works after strong women figures, such as Phoebe, Vivienne, Salome, and Cleopatra. At one point, she was even photographed as Cleopatra, which you will see later. Um, in her lifetime, she wrote approximately 300 works of var various genres, ranging from solo, keyboard, to chamber music, songs, choral, and orchestral music. For piano, there are concert pieces, poetic and picturesque pieces, dances, pieces for four hands, and for two pianos, as well as several pedagogical pieces that she dedicated to her grandchildren. She wrote several vocal works, which include about 40 melodies, or French art songs, as well as a mass. None of her choral pieces were published during her lifetime. As for her songs, about half of them re remained unpublished at the time of her death. Although she wrote primarily for organ, piano, and voice, she showed a fondness for flute and violin and cello. Her friendship with renowned French flutist Louis Fleury resulted in, in several works for flute and piano. As for her chamber works, they consist of sonatas, quartets, and several trios. Her second piano quartet was written when she was 70 years old, and it was what she considered to be her musical testament. In terms of publishing her works and garnering respect as a real composer, Boni went by the androgynous name Mel. She also used her maiden name to further obscure her identity as a woman. Reluctance on part of publishers was a result of the perception that her music, which was always rooted in romanticism, 
uh, was considered outdated by the Parisian public whose interest was in contemporary music at that time. So as a result, her chamber music written in her last years, um, with the exception of her violin and piano sonata, uh, were not published until years after her death. The year before she passed, she wrote to her friend, American flutist Norman Gifford, saying, much limited in my young days by family obligations, although always haunted by musical compositions, I could only start working late in life, and thus, despite my age, I am not a very old composer. She passed away on March 18, 1937, at the age of 79 in Sarcey, a community in the northern suburbs of Paris. Her great-granddaughter writes, the most striking thing in Boni's music is the discrepancy between the moral rigidity of Madame Domange, obsessed by her societal duties and steeped in piety, and the extraordinarily bold sensuality which emerges from the musical works that she produced under her pseudonym. Due in part to the efforts of her great-granddaughter, the Melboni Association was created in 2000 with the purpose of promoting her music by connecting performers, publishers, producers, concert and festival organizers, saying all from near or far can become actors in its mission. I'll briefly talk about her compositional periods, which her, again, her great-granddaughter um, has divided into three periods. And these are primarily based on personal events in her life. The first period consists of charming works that were easily accessible to the amateur market. The second period consists primarily of scholarly works which required a higher level of skill compared to the previous period. And the third period was dominated by spiritual music, primarily for organ as well as religious choral works. For Boni, the organ allowed one to be closest to God. In relation to these periods, Geraldine uh, Padilla categorizes Boni's compositional outputs uh, into three stages. First, a tentative girl who is still trying to find her musical identity. Second, an inspired woman who was determined to promote her works and earn the recognition she deserved. And lastly, an old woman who, despite her debilitating health, lived through her music with vigor and purpose. Boni's earliest chamber work, Nocturne for String Trio and Harp, was written when she was 34 years old and in which she wrote on the manuscript, a time when she does not take herself seriously. Do not publish. There's an evolution uh, that you can trace through her uh, piano writing and chamber music uh, which directly relate to uh, periods in her life. So in her first style, the piano was mo mostly used as an accompaniment for the upper instruments that had the melody. Uh, music was for use in homes or salons and was accessible to amateur musicians. From the second period comes some of Boni's most inspired works and where her passion for chamber music blossomed. Between 1900 and 1905, she wrote seven chamber works, including a trio, a quartet, and two sonatas, one of which you'll hear today. At this point, the role of the piano became central in her chamber works, and this shifted the consumer as now the more technically demanding parts required higher musicianship skills, namely that of professionals. This shift also meant her music was now being performed in concert halls. So now I will discuss the first piece that we will play for you, Scène du la Forêt, or otherwise known as Forest Scenes. She dedicated this to Norman Gifford, who I previously mentioned was a friend, American flutist. And uh, in contrast to absolute music, uh, which is based on abstract constructions and sound, Scène du la Forêt is programmatic in nature. Britannica defines program music as instrumental music that carries some 
extra musical meaning, some program of literary idea, legend, scenic description, or personal drama. There's a theory that two previous works serve as the foundation of this piece. Roots supposedly stem from Boni's 1904 piece titled Trio for Chromatic Harp and Two Wind Instruments, which earned her an honorable mention. The manuscript for this work has unfortunately been lost. Two years later in 1907, a reworked version with three movement appears, titled Suite for Horn, Flute, and Piano, which now replaces the harp with piano. 21 years later in 1928, Saint du La Forêt for Flute, Horn, and Piano, and with four movements, materializes. But it was not until almost a century later that the first published edition becomes available under COSAC. COSAC Publishing also released a version replacing the piano with harp, which helped recreate the original intention of Boni. Uh, Saint du La Forêt showcases Boni's knowledge in orchestration by way of how she captures the sounds of nature through instruments. In this regard alone, all three instruments are associated with themes found in nature. To begin, oh, so we see Pan here with his pan pipes. Um, so according to Michael Ferber, the pan pipe in literature is the most distinctive rustic or pastoral, pastoral instrument. As such, it's connected to uh, flora and fauna. This association begins with the satyr Pan, who in Greek mythology is the god of nature and who is credited with the invention of the musical instrument. The story goes that while trying to flee from unwanted advances from Pan, the woodland nymph Syrinx turned into a bunch of reeds. And when Pan was crying out for her, these reeds made a plaintive sound which then led him to construct the first panpipe. Now, as for the horn, the origins, as you can see, I put hunting horn. Um, the horn's history can be traced back to a long tradition of its integral role in the hunt. The hunting horn became so integrated with the identity of the hunting gentry that it became an icon for the sport. Playing the hunting horn was considered to be a necessary skill and was a tradition passed down from generation to generation and from court to court. In 2020, uh, the organization uh, UNESCO recognized the tradition of playing the hunting horn as intangible cultural heritage. As you can see here, it might be a little difficult to see, but we have all these symbols on the left side. Um, this is a tablature um, for from the middle part of the 16th century, which indicates several different types of horn calls, which range from the beginning of day, such as to call the company in the morning, all the way to the end of the hunt, the strike of nine to draw home the company. Although the piano replaces the harp in this version, I do want to mention just a few points. Um, in Greek mythology, Orpheus was so skilled at playing the lyre that he charmed animals and could make trees and rocks move. The harp is the symbol of Saint Cecilia, the paint, patron saint of muses, musicians. It's also symbolic of heaven and hope. Considering the title of the piece, I'd like to next look at poetic imagery and literary symbolism of forests and woods. Ferber writes that although forests in literature were originally places of great danger, hence the saying, not yet out of the woods, with the surge of romanticism, a new appreciation of wilderness emerges, especially for forests, mountains, seashores, sometimes with religious inten intensity. The forest and woods often represent a type of natural sanctuary. One blog writer, writes, the central story quality of the forest is that it is a natural cathedral. They go on to say, tall trees with their leaves hanging over us and protecting us seem like the oldest wise men assuring us that whatever the circumstances, 
It will resolve as time moves on. It is the place where contemplative people go and to which lovers sneak away. As we know, the forest is home to many a magical community in fairy tale settings. In Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream, for example, the, the woods outside Athens are the realms of fairies and spirits. For this piece in particular, I will discuss uh, the connection between movements of the uh, titles of a movement and their connection, connection to literary symbolism as well as interesting parallels between the key signatures Boni chose for this piece and the relation to aesthetics and characteristics of musical keys, according to Schubert. Uh, so just brief information about Schubert. Uh, he lived more than a century prior to Boni, and uh, he wrote uh, ideas on the aesthetics of musical art on the characteristics of the musical keys written in 1784 and published in Vienna in 1806. So the first movement uh, unfolds with a nighttime scene, nocturne. Uh, the bookend sections of this movement are written in the key of E flat major, which for Schubert is the key of love, devoutness, of intimate dialogue with the divine, its three flats represent the Holy Trinity. The piano part, which is harp-like in nature, mimics twinkling stars in the night sky, transporting the listener into the calm and soothing atmosphere of nighttime. A feature of this movement is a reoccurring and unifying motive of E flat to D flat, which is first presented in the horn part and played for 20 measures straight. Much to the relief of the horn player, uh, the two-note mo mo two motive moves on to the piano part and is now featured there. Um, this motive obscures the tonality of the movement, especially when it's played over harmonies in the piano that are not closely related. So one example here is we can see the piano shifts from E flat major to A major, which provides a, a lulling and free floating sort of feeling. I'm going to kind of zoom by here. Um, in the middle section, we're in D flat major, and the continuation of the motive is seen in all three clefs. And yes, I said three clefs in the piano part. Uh, and it's basically permeates the entirety of, of the movement. For Schubert, the key of D-flat major is a key of yearning, which is resolved in sorrow or ecstasy. This key cannot laugh, but it smiles. It cannot weep, but it can at least make the face of one who might cry. Thus, only very unusual characters or sentiments can be set in this key. In this movement, um, the use of augmented chords, through the use of that, Boni moves away from functional harmony by using coloristic harmonies common in impressionistic works. A predominant feature of this movement, and actually the piece as a whole, is the avoidance of a tonal center until the final cadence of each movement, where the tonic is finally established. Uh, Padilla surmises that perhaps the lack of tonal center in this particular movement that helps depict the blanketing sense of darkness that nighttime evokes. Second movement, a lube at dawn. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna talk about what, um, in, in literature, according to Farber, poets since Homer have delighted in describing dawn in all of its glory perhaps as a reflection of religious cults com common to Indo-European cultures, Dawn has been personified as a young woman. Written in the key of B-flat major, which for Schubert is of happy love, good conscience, hope, and longing for a better 
world. Here, um, the opening sextuplets in the piano part evoke the imagery of nature awakening. We see another two note motive in the piano part. And the left hand, when you listen to this, um, descends and ascends, mimics a bird or a butterfly bobbing up and down as it weaves. All right, so uh, there are some wake up calls in the horn part, which you will hear. Uh, other features of this movement are, are impressionistic scales. It's a main feature of this piece. And the penultimate, oops, penultimate measure features two contrary um, scales. Okay, third movement, uh, avocation. The word invocation stems from the Latin verb invocare, which means to call on, invoke, or to give. Invocation is defined as the act of calling upon a deity, spirit, etc., for aid, protection, inspiration, or the like. Supplication. A form of prayer evo invoking God's presence, especially one said at the beginning of a religious service or public ceremony. For Padilla, this movement portrays a prayer to the goddess Artemis, who is the subject of the final movement. Begins, uh, well, it's in 3-4 time, which historically has correlation with the Holy Trinity. And um, <clears throat> there's a technique called planing, which uh, sounds very harp-like, uh, where chords move up and down a scale, and I'll just play a brief clip. Very harp-like. Further tying into the religious aspect of this piece uh, is that the flute part features a predominant use of triplets as its primary rhythmic motive, while the piano part takes on a more chorale-like role. Compared to previous movements, the transitions between keys are simpler and more traditional in this movement. Uh, <coughs> it ends, oops, in the key of F major, which is for uh, Schubert, amiable and calm. All right, last movement for Artemis. This is based on uh, Artemis, who in ancient Greek mythology and religion is the Olympian goddess of the hunt and all things pertaining to the wilderness, including wild animals and vegetation. Like her twin brother, Apollo, she is kurotrophic deity, which is a child nurturing deity. And she's the patron and protectress of children as well as of mothers in childbirth. As the firstborn of the two, she assisted her mother with the birth of her twin brother, Apollo. Whereas Apollo is associated with the sun, she uh, is associated with the moon, coolness, and therefore chastity. She's protectress of virgins and is fierce with those who are not so careful. In classical literature tradition, the moon is invariably feminine, which is interesting considering the masculine gender of the original root word. So she's clad with a bow and arrow, and she's portrayed as a hunting goddess of the woods surrounded by an entourage of animals, typically a stag, doe, or dog. Woodland nymphs, and in some cases mortals, such as hunters, sometimes are also seen accompanying her. Uh, this movement, according to Padilla, portrays the duality of Artemis' two distinct moods or characteristics. The first is the goddess who loves the wild and hunting, and the second, the gentle spirit who cares for the young of all living things. The opening presents a motive of what sounds like a hunting call from afar, 
offering a sneak peek into the scene that's about to unfold. While the horn retains its role in the hunt, flute continues to portray flora and fauna with its imitation of bird song. And the piet. Piano lends itself to both characters in here. Um, th there's the gentle side of the goddess here that um, you will hear. Uh, and it's a calm setting, which is appropriate for a midday nap a power nap, if you will. Um, rousing the sleepers, we have, a, we'll, you'll hear wake up bells and a horn call heard from afar. It's at this point where the piece modulates to the key of C major. According to Schubert, the attributes of this key are utterly pure. Its character connotes innocence, simplicity, naivete, the language of children. This al aligns really well with the subject of this particular movement, given her instinct to protect children. The final section of this piece um, <coughs> has a twist to it. Uh, features the last restatement of the hunting motif, but this time it has a twist. So we're expecting to hear this, the tonic. But instead, we, are, we hear this. So taking it yet another step into tonal ambiguity, uh, Boni eludes the listener one final time by writing the penultimate chord as a C-flat augmented chord. So instead of that, we get... So if you're like me, this chord progression may catch you by surprise, as it did when I first heard the piece, and I actually didn't realize it was the end of the piece. <laughs> so maybe that will be your <laughs> reaction. So to close, uh, with the exception of simplistic harmonies and modulations featured in the third movement, the transitions in this piece are not characteristic of her t first two compositional periods. And instead, she uses chords primarily for color and effect to strengthen the programmatic nature of this work. As a whole, it's heavily influenced by Impressionism, Impressionism, um, which captures the essence of modernism without completely turning away from form of the Romantic period. I hope you enjoy our performance of saint du la Forêt from 1928.
enjoyed that. Thank you to my friends for playing and joining me on that. Uh, so I will just briefly, oh, I forgot to left, leave the four scenes for your viewing pleasure as we play. Oh, well. Okay, so uh, just briefly about the cello sonata. Uh, the first of the three sonatas she wrote uh, was the flute sonata, um, <coughs> written in 1904. And this key of C-sharp minor for Schubert is a penitential lament, intimate dialogue with God, a friend, or one's lifelong companion. Sighs of unrequited friendship and love lie within its range. Second comes from the second sonata is the, the one you'll be hearing this afternoon, and that was written also the same year, 1904, but not published until 1905. Her third sonata um, is for violin and piano, which is in the key of F sharp minor. A dark key, it tears and pulls at the passions like a vicious dog at one's clothing. Resentment and displeasure is its language. It appears impossible for this key to be content in its position, and it longs continually for the quiet of A major or the triumphant ecstasy of D major. So this piano uh, and cello sonata harkens back to her middle period of scholarly works. And she, notice that she titled it as a piano and cello sonata rather than the other way around. Schumann almost, uh, also titled his Opus 105 uh, piano and violin sonatas as such, as did Brahms uh, with his Opus 120 piano and clarinet sonatas. Uh, this piece is dedicated to Maurice de, Mis de Mison, art critic, writer, and doctor of law. Um, this piece premiered at the Salle Berlioz by uh, cellist Louis Fournier, who you see on the bottom there, and Ricardo Vignes, who uh, was actually a Spanish pianist and the teacher of Poulenc, and he premiered works by Debussy, Ravel, Satie, The Fay, and Aldemis. So the main feature of this piece is it, it's in cyclic form, which is a sort of glue that unifies multi-movement works. It's a compositional form characterized by the repetition in a latter movement or part of the piece of motives, themes, or whole sections from an earlier movement in order to unify structure. Cyclic technique was used regularly in the generation following Beethoven with composers such as Schumann, uh, Schubert, Brahms, and Franck, who had actually mentored Bonnie both in piano and composition. This is an important concept that will be discussed in this piece. The opening begins, um, so <coughs> quasi andante, moderately, um, almost at a walking pace. Begins with this beautiful four note chord from the cello. And if we go back to Schubert, F, uh, the key of F major is amiable and calm. The first primary theme is introduced, and you'll later see this theme uh, developed in the third movement. Um, so I just want to play it for you to get it in your ear. And you'll see later what she does with that theme in the third movement. Uh, in the Allegretto, she introduces triplets, which becomes the primary rhythmic motive that unifies uh, all three movements together. Uh, once again, impressionistic scales, like the whole tone scales I previously mentioned, uh, makes an appearance towards the conclusion of this movement. And um, these, this scale permeates both cello and piano parts in multiple layers, as you can see, going on simultaneously. She sticks for the ending to a traditional 5-1 cadence and ends on a pleasant C major chord. Uh, the second movement, très slow, <coughs> very slow, uh, is written in 3-2 meter in the key of D flat major. Um, as you can see, the flowing triplets marked dolce legato permeate the entirety of this movement. And the primary thematic material is based on a descending line, both in the piano and cello parts. Mimics, perhaps, the falling of tears. Mm -hmm. 
So she treats this like a canon, where it's in one voice, and then in the left hand, and then in the cello. Um, as with forest scenes, this movement features unusual modulations as well between unrelated keys. Where we would expect to hear a D-flat major to follow an A-flat dominant seven, Boni maintains a floating sense of suspension of harmony by following with a D major seven. So instead of that traditional sound, we get... And as with the first movement, uh, she uses a traditional donic dominant, uh, dominant tonic cadence, which she suspends for the last two measures. All right, the last movement here, uh, moderato molto, very moderate, begins in the key of D minor. Now, if we go back to Schubert, this is melancholy womanliness, bitterness, and bad temper. <laughs> This changes shortly thereafter. Uh, and although unexpected, um, giving the pre preceding D7 chord, the secondary theme in B flat appears via common tone modulation. Um, a dark and haunting third theme is presented in the piano left hand. probably my favorite part. <laughs> um, but this darkness is lifted shortly after um, as the uh, piece goes into the key of D major. A unique feature of this movement is that it contains a brief cadenza in the piano part. Um, a cadenza is defined as a solo passage, which typically uh, appears near the end of a movement that is either improvised or written out and it's usually in free rhythmic form and allows for virtuosic display. So Boni does something called thematic transformation. So here, um, she presents the theme from the first movement, but this time uh, with a lowered scale degree on its descent, which adds a t tinge of sadness. So here's from the first movement. <laughs> But now she does this. That lowered scale degree adding that, that bit of sadness. Um, so perhaps thinking of the positive side of life, um, the coda ends in the relative key of B flat major, which she suspends for the remainder of the piece. So rather than end in D minor as the movement began, um, the piece aptly concludes uh, in this key, which according to Schubert, represents happy love, good conscience, hope and longing for a better world. I really love that. So in closing, Boni's music continues to be performed today largely due to the efforts of her great granddaughter. Uh, her music still continues to be criticized, however. Uh, in 2008, a music critic wrote, it's too bad that women had such a hard time of it. But like the best women who were composers, she seems only second rate. Still, I'm fond of many a second rate composer, and this is nice music. Another emoji in there. Um, okay, so Beasley writes that Boni lived a life of passion, conflict, and drama torn between her own hopes and aspirations and her sense of duty to her family and faith. This passion and, at times, dissatisfaction is apparent in her musical voice, and her strength of character is clear in her resurgence in the music community long after her educational years concluded. To close, I give you this quote by Boni, who wrote, Music, this divine language, translates all beauty, all truth, all passion, the object of our eternal vows, takes form. So please uh, enjoy as Kyle Champion and I um, present the cello sonata for you. Thank you.
Thank you very much. So I would just like to um, say a couple of, well, a little more than a couple. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. Um, <clears throat> of thank yous. Uh, so first is Val McGlasson, um, who you heard on flute today. Yes. <laughs> Val is a true and trusted friend of mine, and I love her dearly, and I'm really grateful that she uh, is part of this today. Um, I ad really admire her dedication for uh, teaching young people and uh, preparing our next generation of musicians. So thank you, Val. Uh, Sarah Rodnick, whom you heard on horn. <laughs> is just finishing her artist diploma at the University of Redlands. And um, maybe I shouldn't tell you this, but the first time she and I played together was only a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> and uh, it really felt like I was playing with an old friend. We just played together so well and easy, and she just made this easy. So you're a lovely person and player, Sarah. Thank you so much for, for being a part of this. I really appreciate it. Uh, next is Kyle Champion, whom you just heard. <laughs> Kyle has taught at the university for nearly 30 years now, and uh, he's extremely busy. <laughs> he plays Long Beach Symphony, he's the principal cellist of the Redlands Symphony, and um, he has a really full schedule, and yet he made the time to do this, so really grateful uh, for being a part of this, and I should mention that I first met Kyle when I was an undergrad. Um, my roommate was a cellist, and so I got to attend her, her lessons, and I learned a lot from Kyle, so thank you, Kyle. Um, next is this wonderful, beautiful church. I'm so grateful to have this as my home church, and I wouldn't want to be anywhere else than here, and so just grateful to be able to present this um, in such a beautiful venue that is so meaningful to me. Um, next is Jim Tong, who is our music director. Uh, he helped facilitate this, and there's no way I could have done this without his help. Um, Jim, you are like one of my best friends. Um, Jim's also my therapist. He's my, <laughs> my older brother. <laughs> He's the, so many things that he has um, just been an incredible friend. So I love you dearly, Jim. Thank you so much for your help with this. Um, next is uh, Paul Hodson, who's always behind the scenes, and he is in the, the back corner there. He helped facilitate the sound and getting this live streamed and setting all of this up. So thank you so much, Paul. I could not have done this uh, without your help. Um, next is Sophia Ohanian, who is our pianist here actually at, the, um, at church, and she just really helped make um, my time coming in here to rehearse so easy. She just, I could have not done this without her help. And that played a really big role in actually preparing on the piano you'll be playing on. I mean, pianists know this. So I really appreciate all of your help with that. Thank you so much. Um, and then next is Kevin Fitzgerald, who was uh, my professor at USC. Uh, he was just instrumental um, during my time there. And I, he was really God sent to me, I had the right person at the right time. And there were some weeks where I'd go in and I had absolutely nothing prepared. <laughs> and we would just talk and he was just been a huge source of inspiration and support and believing in me when I didn't quite believe <laughs> in my ability. So thank you so much. Um, and then uh, the sound clips, I, I, there's no way I could have done this without um, the help of a pro. And so I'd like to thank uh, Jerry Whiting, who also happens to be my partner. So he was kind of forced to do this, you see. Um, he had no choice. Uh, just thank you for being the best partner I could ever ask for. I, I love you dearly, and you've been a huge part of keeping me sane throughout all of this. So love you. And um, last is my wonderful family who just stepped out uh, to prepare <laughs> Um, the reception, so please stay if you can. I know some of you have to perform uh, later today at four o'clock, and um, so <clears throat> anyway, my thanks to my family for putting this together, and thank you all for being here. This means 
a lot to me that you took time out of your day to join me. So have a wonderful afternoon, and if I see you, I welcome any questions. Thank you, Rosemary. Many thanks. Thank you.